Welcome into the PFN Bengals podcast. I am Dallas Robinson. As always, he is Jay Morrison, and we have a third guest today, Mr. Ian Cummings, PFN's lead draft analyst, one of the best in the biz, is here to give us all the intel for what the Bengals are going to do in round one and beyond in the upcoming draft. Ian, how are you doing today? How's the draft pre-draft process treating you? It's been good, man. It's been a little hectic for sure, which you expect this time of year. A lot of information to take in and, you know, a lot of reports that are clashing, right? So how do you focus on your process and just kind of get tunnel vision, right? It's a lot, but it's been fun. It's a grind. We signed up for it. I just finished up the um, uh, scouting podcast this morning with Derek Tate. We talked quarterbacks, uh, so that was a lot of fun, but uh, excited to talk Bengals and all the team needs and different prospects at different positions because ultimately each team, all 32, there's a different strategy that they could take on and a lot of players that could fit that so it's fun to kind of get the different complexion for each team and see how they can fill that out i can't find time to sleep myself i don't know how you do it i mean watching all this film i mean how much sleep do you get this time of year it's tough man because you, you got to set some time for that it's a little important for sure <laughs> but um at the same time there's so much information so what what i've gotten better at over the years is you know i think this is my third or fourth year doing this full time right so you learn a little bit more about the evaluation process and how you can make it more efficient right and i think if you do the work during the season as much as you can like anytime you see something just write it down make a note of it because it'll make it easy easier for you when you go back you know you do want to rewatch the tape a few times but you also want to make sure you get an impression early on so that you're not working from zero right so you know doing that work efficiently kind of helps you maintain that balance but to your point you always want to watch the tape again see if there's anything you missed and that does take some time so uh we try and get at least six or seven hours if we can uh it's a it's a process (laughs) but it's it's a fun one I, I do want to get into your process later. I think we'll talk about that later, just how you actually do kind of cover all these prospects and get ready for this draft every year. It's a, just an amazing process, at least from a, from afar. Let's go ahead and get into it for these prospects for the Bengals could consider at, at number 18 in round one. At least for Jay and I, as we've talked about on this show, is that offensive tackle, despite the Bengals signing Trent Brown, I think is still where we're projecting the Bengals to go in round one. Trent Brown's just on that one-year deal. He's older. I think the Bengals are looking for a guy who could be their long-term right tackle. This is a good year, Ian, I think, to find that right tackle in round one. There's, There are, I think, seven or eight guys who the on the PFN big board who are within the top 25. I think several of those could be available when the Bengals uh, come on the board in round one. My question for you is, do you think if you're the Bengals, do you think they need to pursue a round one offensive tackle or is there the depth that they could get somebody in round two and round three who could be a starter, maybe not in year one, but maybe down the line? Or is it they need to get that guy at 18 if they're going to find an elite long term option? I think the options are a little more sparse on day two if you want to wait for that. I, I think the the benefit of this class, not only having the, the high-end talent, but also the volume of high-end talent. You mentioned it. There's seven or eight guys in the top 25, and Tyler Guyton is right outside it. Jordan Morgan is right there, too. So Kingsley Suamataya from BYU as well. So this year, people have been talking about it offensive tackle the record for going in round one is like seven i think like it could be broken this year that's not an exaggeration there's a lot of volume at the top of the class and i think that's the benefit is that if you're the bengals you could get any number of guys and they could end up being that long-term starter for you now i think signing trent brown enables enables you to have a little more flexibility there you don't you're not you're not cornered into taking a tackle now like you do have some flexibility but I think the options deteriorate a little bit in the day two range just because there isn't that volume there. Uh, a guy that I would circle on day two is Roger Rosengarten from Washington, a natural right tackle. But again, beyond that, you don't have a ton of guys. Kieran Amagaji from Yale is another, but he's mainly a left tackle, doesn't have a ton of experience. So you are going to have to develop that a little bit. Patrick Paul from Houston has a lot of technical areas to you know work on. He's not the most flexible, malleable athlete too. So in round one, right i don't think you have to go with tackle because you have trent brown and orlando brown you can you have a decent floor there where you can develop a guy in the middle rounds if you want to but the appeal of round one in this tackle class is that there is so much volume you could come away with a guy like amarius mims or troy fatanu who could play guard early on if you want him to you got jc latham from alabama right you've got tyler guyton from oklahoma who i mentioned who's got really nice athleticism recovery capacity flexibility and length um, there's a there's just a lot of options, and I think the vo- the volume is superior in the round one range. So if you do wait, you don't have a guarantee that you're gonna get a guy in the middle round. So you have more a higher chance in round one that you will. So as a guy that watches a lot of these prospects, not just this year but through the years, you see this happen a lot in college, where 
a guy plays right tackle and then the left tackle moves on to the pros and he moves over to the left side or sometimes guys go left to right. It, there's It's kind of two schools of thought when you get in the NFL. Some people say it is a – it's a big – change and other guys are like ah it's not that big of a deal we saw jonah williams do it last year maybe have the best year of his career so so of these guys of these top seven six seven guys who do you think would be the best fit to to come in and and possibly unseat trent brown and be the starter this year at right tackle or if he doesn't do it this year be the best option as a long-term right tackle for this team for sure. And it's a good question because, you know, Penny Sewell did it for the Lions too, played yeah. left tackle in Oregon and went to right tackle. The traits I look for, if you're projecting to right tackle, athleticism for sure, right? Because that that kind of increases your margin for error, balance, coordination, things like that. Because everything you do at a certain spot is mirrored at right tackle. You know, left tackle, yeah. uh, you're kicking with your left foot, right tackle, you're kicking with your right foot, you know, your hands, your feet, it's all mirrored. So I want guys who have that balance and that coordination and that athleticism to lean on so that they're not too uncoordinated where rushers can take advantage of that, right? So I look at guys in this class, Obviously, if you can get a guy with pre-existing experience on the right side, it's a little better because it's not just the sweeping change right off the bat. Amarius Mims from Georgia is the first one that stands out to me. Doesn't have a ton of experience, interestingly enough. I think he only started 10 games in his career, right? And he had some injury issues too. But within that small window, he played at both left and right tackle. So there's already experience there. He's shown that he can shift from side to side. And for a guy who's like 6'8", 340. He's very good at dropping the anchor, acquiring leverage. I think he's got very good anchor placement for his age too. And I do think he has that athletic ability to lean on early on while he's still refining his hands. So he's a guy who's got left-right versatility. I think right away can be a really good swing tackle for you, but then can file into right tackle with a little bit of time to grow. J.C. Latham from Alabama is an obvious choice. He's definitely a lot bigger, not quite as athletic in the lateral mode, but I, I do think he's very explosive off the line. I think his pass protection ability is kind of underrated. He's very balanced out of his pass sets, very smooth with his footwork and his recovery. And then he can latch on. And once he does, he can suffocate power rushes. So he's a natural right tackle. He'd be able to fit there. And then Troy Fautanu for me for Washington is another one that kind of files under because he's already proven that he can move across the line. And those trademark traits that you look for when you're projecting that balance, athleticism, recovery ability, coordination, he's probably one of the best in this class in all of those categories. And then he's 6'4", 320 with 34 and a half inch arms. So really checks every single box for you. So looking for guys that could file into right tackle if needed, those are the names that come to mind for me right off the bat. Now, obviously, you got Joe Walt and Olu Fashanu in this class as well. Yeah. I don't expect either one to be there for the Bengals. I think you're going to have to make a move up. Olu, there have been some mocks where he moves down to the teens, but I look at the New Orleans Saints at 14. It's probably his floor because they need both tackle spots. I think Fashanu was too good a prospect to pass up there. So a lot of options for sure. Those are the ones that come to mind for me. I think speaking of that versatility along the offensive line too, it not just the ability to play both tackle spots, but – the Bengals could be looking for someone to play left guard. I think Cordell yeah. Volson is not necessarily locked into a starting role. If the Bengals are happy with what Trent Brown looks like and are happy with his conditioning going into the year and he's guaranteed to be the right tackle, I think you could see that if the Bengals take a first round tackle, that guy shift into, into left guard. You mentioned Fatanu was a guy who I think most people think could play maybe all five spots along the offensive line. Is he the guy, if the Bengals are looking for that versatile guy who could also shift to guard, or are some of these other first-run options, could they also play on the interior? Yeah, and actually, it's a good pivot because there's one guy that I forgot to mention, Talia Sifuaga from Oregon State. I don't know how I forgot him at first because he's very high on my board. He's a top 15 guy, but uh, he's a natural right tackle as well. Uh, sometimes there's just so many names going in your head. Sometimes you forget one for a second. got to take some time to remember it. But Fuaga is a fun one, too, because, again, balance, coordination, he's got that. He's got really good upper-lower synergy with his pass protection ability very explosive athlete off the line really rangy in the run game too so another one who translates well right tackle talia sifuaga and he translates well projects well anyway if you want to move him to guard because again that is that athleticism that explosiveness that power drive that physicality all of those things are, are there for him and the anchor strength to hold strong pass protection to play square to rushers as well i think he projects very well there but to your point troy fatanu it's probably the best one if you're looking for a tackle who can play guard right off the bat because he actually has pre-existing experience at guard. He played guard at Washington before moving to tackle, and he was very good there. I think his natural leverage at 6'4", plays really well. One thing that I look for for guards, 
do you have that natural leverage and that knee bend right to acquire leverage but then also the proportional length to get inside your opponent's frame while you're playing with proper pad level right and you look at Fatanu 34 and a half inch arms that'll do it and you see that combination work in tandem on tape so often where he can gather guys inside his frame and just lock out with that length and that core strength but he's also very athletic very smooth in recovery and very powerful as a run blocker too so i think that pre-existing experience in both spots he's probably the guy that projects best in that role if you're looking for a tackle who can play guard early on and then shift to tackle later on if you need him to troy fatan who is kind of that chess piece who kind of increases your security across the board if we uh we flip it to the other trench and go to the defensive line it seems like every mock i see has these guys right next to each other every positional ranking has i mean where do you come down on the johnny newton and byron murphy debate who's better in your mind who would be a better fit for the bengals uh between those two if they go that way in the first round it's a tough discussion man because i love both guys and i know they've been really closely rated for pretty much the whole cycle i've been (laughs) in the camp of johnny newton is a little bit better as a prospect for pretty much the whole time and the more i reevaluate the more i kind of get stronger in that opinion I, i like byron murphy the second a lot he's explosive he's twitchy he's tenacious he's got great torque um, on his extensions so he can sequence moves and get guys off balance with his power um but i and i think they're both pretty similarly built too they're both around 6 1 300 i think murphy weighed in a little under 300 but his playing weight's probably around 305 the same for newton they got both i think both have over 32 inch arms too so good proportional length for what you're looking for to me though they're both explosive. They're both well leveraged in run defense. I think Murphy's a little bit better at taking combo blocks. I think he's a little bit better at that. But Johnny Newton, to me, as a one gapper, is just so sound as a player. He's such a high IQ player with really good strength. And then I think what, what separates Newton is his flexibility. His torso flexibility is insane. His ankle flexion to pry around blocks while using strong hands to decouple extensions is really, it's really impressive. And that's one of the most impressive things that I've seen from a DT prospect in a few years, actually. I think Johnny Newton really has a high-level trait in that regard. So Johnny Newton is the higher prospect for me. That said, because Murphy has the mass to uh, absorb combo blocks a little bit better, I wouldn't mind the Bengals taking him over because he's still very explosive. He's got very violent hands. But if we're talking just about a prospect, if you're if you're the Bengals and you're just looking for a guy who can be that high-level three-tech disruptor, if it's not really about absorbing combo blocks, I probably prefer Newton just because he's so flexible. And that flexibility is a finishing trait that really helps him see reps through to the end and disrupt the quarterback, disrupt the run running lanes and occlude running lanes. I think it's what makes him a more complete player. But I'm a big fan of both guys. How do you view Newton and Murphy in terms of being ready to contribute from day one? Because I think defensive tackle is an area that the Bengals are going to need a contributor from day one. They they added Sheldon Rankins and free agency. They still have B.J. Hill, but they lost D.J. Reader. And unless they're counting on Zach Carter, who's a former third round pick, this is if they take a first round defensive tackle, this is a guy who's going to have to be ready to step in, play from day one and probably play a significant amount of snaps. Is the, between Newton and Murphy, are both of those guys ready to do that? Is one more ready than the other? Does one need more development? How do you kind of view those guys from their immediate contributions? I think they're both pretty ready. I think they're both they're they're not there aren't too many hairs to split. I think with Murphy again, you know, just he's he's got a really dense compact frame for a guy who's six one three hundred. And again, he'll probably play closer to three hundred five, maybe three hundred eight. Um, but he's very compact, well leveraged, and he uses that leverage to absorb blocks. He's got very good lower body strength too, which allows him to hold the line and avoid displacement. So I think that's something that anchors his game as being a really good run defender, just in, with the density and the compact strength that he has. But Newton, at the same time, I think Newton Newton's a very good run, run defender too. I, I don't think he's quite as strong in his lower body as Murphy, but still very good at one gapping, holding the line and using that you know leverage game to win those blocks and decouple, stack and shed. He's shown he can do that. And then I think with Newton, there's a little bit more actionable, actionable ability on day one with um, moving him across the line. You know, if you want him to rush at five tech on passing downs, he can do that. He's very good at that. He's got the ankle flexion to win under three seconds from five tech, which at six one three hundred is pretty absurd. But he he can do it for sure. So I think Newton gives you a little more alignment flexibility. Murphy gives you a tiny bit more run defense utility. But I think it's splitting hairs at that point. I think they're both ready to contribute on day one, and they have the high level upside. You know, as Dallas said, that it, this feels what eighty percent they're going to go offensive tackle in the first round. So that if they do that, like we expect, you take those two off the board. You're not going to get them in the second round um, unless the big ones make a crazy trade up, which I wouldn't see that happening. 
worst case scenario, Tavondre Sweat is gone in, when they pick at 49. He's kind of viewed as like the the cream of the crop when it comes to the, the run stoppers in this class. So if they don't get him, who are some guys third, fourth, fifth round, wherever it might be, where they can get, where they can, they can find that, maybe not that next DJ reader. That's a lot of pressure to put on a guy, but a guy that can come in, eat up multiple blocks, be a run stopper, um, create space, and maybe push the pocket a little bit too. I think that was underrated in DJ's game, uh, but, but who, not a true technique, a three tech guys that are, that are more nose tackles, run stoppers, where, where are those guys? Who are the best ones after you get past sweat? Yeah, and it's a good question because it's it's a little tougher to find those guys. Uh, the, it's kind of a yeah. niche role that can be tough to fill. McKinley Jackson from Texas A&M is the first name that comes to mind. I almost like his value in round three or round four better than Sweat's in round two. I like Sweat a lot, but mm. I think McKinley Jackson, I think the trade-off is Sweat's a little bit longer. He has a little more surface area to you know anchor back on when he's absorbing power. But McKinley Jackson is like 6'1", 320 really twitched up for his size you talk about being able to push the pocket and provide some pass rushing value he's got that for sure i think he plays with better functional athleticism than he tested with but even then i think he had a 10 yard split over the 60th percentile for dt so you're lo- working with a good explosiveness for that kind of size he's got good twitch and energy in his motion and i think that leverage allows him to get under guys and forklift up and hold the line again he's not you know he's not as long as sweat and that's where that trade-off comes in but if you're looking for a nose tackle with that pass rushing utility and the density, the um, the mass to absorb combo blocks and double teams, McKinley Jackson, is um he's up there for sure. I think at times, because he doesn't quite have as much mass or surface area in his lower body, he will play upright sometimes to kind of counteract that, and that can get him on his skates. So that's, a, that's something he'll have to correct, but there is a lot to work with. So McKinley Jackson, round three, I can definitely see him being one. Round four, round five, and we've seen teams – reach on nose tackles if they like their potential like the lions took broderick martin in round three uh last year now he or it was either 2022 or 2023 he didn't do much in his rookie year but that's kind of representation like it's such a niche role it's stuff it's such a tough one to find that teams are willing to draft those guys a little higher if they can fulfill that justin rogers from auburn is another one that kind of pops into my head uh, a little bit more of that pure run stuffer there isn't quite as much actionable pass rushing ability although i do think he has good bursts for his size uh, just a really dense compact guy with good mass who can hold the line absorb double teams and you know keep his other his teammates clean right that's kind of what you're looking for in a baseline role so day three he'd be a solid option Fabian Lovett from Florida State is an interesting one because he's a little bit lighter. He's around 6'4", I think, in the, in the three teens, like I think 315 around. Mm-hmm. But he's really good at playing one tech, and he's actually got really good play strength for his size. He's got very good length as well, I think 35-inch arms. So he can get, get to contact first, very strong, very tenacious player with enough explosion to win up gaps as a pass rusher too. Uh, just a very, very imposing presence in the middle. And then I think... Uh, Evan Anderson from Florida Atlantic is one more that I'll throw out there. 6'1", 6'2", in the 320s range. Again, I, I saw his pro day results today. And I think he had a 30-inch vertical, and that shows up on tape. Like He's actually pretty explosive. He's got that straight line burst for sure. A little bit less developed than some of these other guys on the in the hand usage department and the hand placement department, but you're working with a lot of the raw tools that you would want from a nose tackle. So you're going to have to develop them a little bit, but Evan Anderson has some of the things that you can't teach. So I could see him being an option round five, round six, round seven. Um, and then it kind of peters off after that, but those are some nose tackle mm-hmm. options. Let's go back to the offensive side of the ball real quick. I think, you know, the Brock Bowers debate is going to be a big debate, not just in Cincinnati, but league wide and the value of taking tight ends, Early in the first round, I think, has been a subject ever since Kyle Pitts was taken number four of all a few years ago and whether that tight end has to become an all pro to justify that contract. And I think we can get into all that at some other point. I just want to get your assessment of Brock Bowers, the player, though. I mean, it's you've got him, I think, at number five on the big board. He's viewed as the next great tight end. He's viewed as the next great slot receiver. He's viewed as a lot of different things. What's your kind of overall assessment on Brock Bowers and how he fits into the 2024 NFL and, and how teams are conducting their passing game, games this season. Yeah, for sure. I've I've always maintained people get scared of the tight end label. And I, I sometimes I think it's overblown again because you look at what Sam Laporta was able to do for the Lions last year. Like, hey, if you can get the right tight end, he can be very valuable for your offense. Then at the same time, I think positional designations, some players fall above that. I think Brock Bowers is one who does. People look at him as the tight end. 
he's not just a tight end for me. He's a weapon. You know, you can scheme him touches as a big slot. You can scheme him off motions, right? He's a rack threat. Uh, he can explode up the seam. He can separate on digs. His three-level framework as a, just a weapon on the offense is really impressive to me. Around, I think, 6'3", 240s, right? So, you know, around average size for a tight end, but you look at his speed just as a pure athlete and a weapon. He's a size-speed anomaly. He can work up the seam and stack guys with that with that explosion, and then he's got really good instincts and hand strength at the catch point. As a rack threat, his contact balance, his leg churn, right? You know, all very strong parts of his game. And he's pretty agile as a one-cut mover, too. He's a little stiff in the hips sometimes, but I think getting him in that runway as that explosive vertical mover, uh, there's so much upside to be had with him as a rack threat in space because he's so tough to take down with his momentum and his play strength. So, you know, I look at that part of his game and his route tree. I think it's good enough. I think his hands are very good. I just look at his three-level threat framework across the board, and I see a very complete weapon who... You know, might not be a traditional tight end, but if you get him with a creative offensive coordinator who can scheme him touches, you know, he can play big slot. He can play in line if you want him to. He's not that's that's one caveat with his profile. Six three, two forties, not the best in line blocker. I think he plays with great effort. I think he mm-hmm. plays with great tenacity. I, I do think he has pretty good technique too, but he just doesn't quite have the mass and the strength to hold up against a 260, 70 pound defensive end consistently, right? So looking at that. That might dilute his upside a bit, but then you move him back outside. You know, he can play the slot. He can separate against nickel defenders with that twitch and that energy, that foot speed. Um, and then he can be scheme touches as that rack threat. I think there's a lot of versatility and flexibility in how you use him. And that expands the potential of your offense as a whole, right? And that vertical speed can stretch defenses thin too. So I think by and large, if you think about him as a weapon, you see the upside. And to me, that's definitely a top five player. Yeah, I, I, I really – he might be the prospect. I look forward to seeing what he does at the next level the most. But I'm going to be watching him on TV. I'm not going to be watching him in person <laughs> because the Bengals have made it clear how they value the tight end position. And even if you look at him as a slot receiver, he, they're not going to take a slot receiver in the first round, and he's not yeah. going to last till the second, obviously. He, he may not even – might not. this whole thing might be moved. He might not even be there at 18 yeah. for them to even consider. But I, I still – second round. I, I can't see him going tight end in the second round, maybe third, if we're talking about that number 97 comp pick, but you, know, you start there at, at 97, that, that third, that their second pick in the third round or fourth. Is there, is there a tight end there that, that you think has a really good, sh- a really high ceiling where right now he's slotted. That's, that's about where he should be drafted third or fourth round. But if things go right, he gets in the right system, gets with the right quarterback, a, a Joe Burrow type where he can really kind of, elevate himself to to being one of the top tight ends in in the league two that come to mind for me right off the bat ben sinnett from kansas state and jared wiley from tcu those are the top ones that come to mind if they're there ben sinnett on my board i he'll i'm gonna finalize on april 15th and he will be moving up my board I've, i've been a big fan of him for a while but he might be closer to a top 50 pick than a top 100 guy so i'm not sure if he'll be there if he's there ben sinnett is a uh, phenomenal value, 6'4", 250. I think he has some Laporta light to him, just in the way that Laporta was able to be schemed open in Ben Johnson's offense with his ability on crossers because of his fluid athleticism, really smooth channeling his acceleration through breaks, and you see that with Ben Sinnott on tape. He's very fluid through breaks, really smooth hip transitions, really explosive athlete, but it's it's kind of an effortless explosiveness that's integrated so seamlessly into his game that you don't always take notice, notice of it. It's not like a Brock Bowers where, yeah, we can tell this guy's a powder keg of an athlete. Ben Sinnott is a little smoother, a little more nuanced, and sometimes that causes you to overlook the athleticism that he does play with because it's very impressive. But um, he's got strong hands over the middle too. He's got a really, really defined route tree, and that's something I like a lot. He's already proven that he can separate in different ways. He's very versatile. He can play H-back if you want him to, big slot. So I like Ben Sinnott a lot. If he's there, uh, I'm running that card up. But Jared Wiley's a fun one too, and I think there's a better chance that he'll be there. 6'6", 250. Uh, he was a former Texas commit, actually, and then he transferred to TCU, I think, in 2022 um, and played really well. And then 2023, he took he took his game up a couple levels as a receiving threat. Very Another very smooth athlete at 6'6", 250, I think 4'6", speed. So he's got that vertical athleticism and this up the seam, and he can work the seam for sure. But he's also a really agile route runner who can cut sharp angles, who can separate and channel speed out of breaks. Uh, and he's got good hands, too. I think he's... You know, very good contorting beyond his frame and making those tough catches with that combined vertical athleticism and body control. And then he's a solid blocker, too. Another guy who can be used as an H-back. Really good leverage acquisition for his size. I think if you can get him, 
I think there's a really good chance he can exceed his draft billing and become an actually quality starter for you. So Jared Wiley is one. A couple more names I'll throw out there. Theo Johnson, Kate Stover, a couple that come to mind as well. They're more day three guys for me. Johnson is Got a limited route tree. He's kind of stiff in the hips a little bit, and some, his hand technique can be inconsistent. Cade Stover isn't an elite athlete, but both guys who have inline ability, uh, blocking ability in space, and just uh, re- enough athleticism and size to work with. I, I was going to ask about Theo Johnson from Penn State because he's, yeah. I mean, this uber athlete, yeah. I, I think a 9.99 relative athletic score from our friend Kentley Platty at RAS. I mean, how do you balance someone's, athletic testing that's just off the charts like that with a a player like Theo Johnson, who it sounds like maybe on tape didn't necessarily line up with that athleticism, what you saw, does that make you go back and watch the tape again when you see these results? How do you, how do you kind of balance all that? These athletic results versus what you saw on the film when you were watching? Yeah. You always want to cross check with the film. I think that's the biggest thing. And with some guys, you, you have an idea of what they're going to test with most guys. If you watch the tape, you can usually Mm -hmm. delineate if they're a good athlete or a great athlete. Right. So you, Usually, if you watch the tape, you're not too surprised by by results. But also, with Theo Johnson, he was on Feldman's freaks list in the summer. So there were some numbers to go back on. So it's like, all right, we kind of know what we're trying to expect here. So there's different information for every guy. And he also had some testing numbers from his high school days that were available, where he tested very well, too, before even training in college. So it's different for every guy. But the main lesson is definitely cross-check with the tape, right? Because the 40-yard dash, you're running in a straight line, right? The three cone tests your change of direction a little bit, but sometimes guys who are more explosive can um, kind of compensate for the change of direction issues, right? You know, sometimes you're a little stiff around those corners, but you explode out of that. It can help your time a little bit. And I think with Theo Johnson, you look at the tape, the explosion, the speed, it shows up for sure. But applying that three cone agility, that's purely testing number on film isn't always quite as easy on those sharp route breaks, those layered routes. And you see that with Theo Johnson. His hips are a little stiff, and he's not great on sharp redirections. He loses momentum very easily. He plays really tall as a route runner. And so that's where technical inefficiencies can kind of sap at that too. So there are a lot of details that go into it. But the bottom line is you see that testing athleticism. Yeah, take note of it, but cross-check with the tape before you make conclusions about how vast their athletic profile is because – there is a difference between testing athleticism and functional athleticism when playing. All right, we've talked about it. Offensive tackle, obviously their number one need. If it goes crazy, if six go off the board before they pick at 18, then maybe they wait till the second round, then you can see it just doesn't fall to them. And, and maybe they go into Saturday without an offensive tackle. Defensive tackle, same thing. Maybe the draft just doesn't fall the right way. It's one of their biggest needs, but you could see them – maybe not addressing it on, on Thursday or Friday wide receiver. I don't think that's the case. I don't think there's any chance that we get to Saturday and the Bengals haven't drafted a wide receiver. So assuming it's not a guy in the first round, all the big names who, who there in that, that second round, that, that second tier of wide receivers is your favorite. Do you think would be a good fit in this Bengals offense to maybe kind of work with T and Jamar for a year. And then when T goes his way next year, steps into that T role, uh, maybe he could play slot this year uh, when it's not Gusecki um, and just find his way to get on the field, ease him in this first year as a rookie and then take over as a starter next year. It's a good question. There's so many receivers to choose from. And you can see me thinking yeah. about it. The gear's going. Yeah. It's more just trying to figure out who <laughs> I want to bring up because there's so many different options. Um, I remember when Dallas gave me the show sheet, It was there was a prompt, who's the Puka Nakua of this class? And I, it's not an exact comp, but there is a guy who fits the Puka profile for me, and it's Jalen Polk from Washington. So I think if, in round two, if you can yeah. get him, you think about how Puka won as a rookie. And, and to be clear, you know, he had Cooper Cup as a mentor. He definitely had the the intangibles off the field that we now see. And then he was in Sean McVay's offense. So a really good situation for him, but he made the most of it. But how Puka won was being able to be utilized from any alignment, slot, boundary, off motions. He's got good flexibility as a route runner, so he can sustain speed through those transitions and then just really strong hands at the catch point. He will convert anything. If he's got a defender inside his frame, if a defender is, you know, kind of contesting the catch with his hands, it doesn't matter. He's bringing it in. And I think one guy 
who fits that profile very well is Jalen Polk from Washington. He's 6'1", 203, I think over 32 inch arms. So again, kind of close to 32. I don't know if it's over 32, but it's close. He's got good length. Uh, so he's already kind of sized like Puka. And then he's, you see that flexibility, that alignment versatility on tape. He can take reps from anywhere. Really explosive second level separator. Late in reps, he can lull DBs into a, into a false sense of security and then explode to create late snap separation. And then his hands are like steel at the catch point. He's so good mm. at gathering the ball, even against contact, really good at just converting, separating, converting, being that alignment versus South threat. So Jalen Polk, for me, is one of the top names. If he's there, would love how you can seamlessly integrate him into an offense. A few other guys, Roman Wilson from Michigan is one that I'm a big fan of. I kind of comp him to Chris Olave just with the way, you know, he's got great speed and explosiveness, but he can bend through breaks like like no one else. I mean, he's like an ice skater out there, man. It's fun to see how he curves around breaks, you know, kind of searing through zones and using that blind spot awareness to his advantage. At the Senior Bowl, he was carving through guys, and you can kind of tell how he can use that speed to separate. And then at the catch point, very instinctive, very good vertical athleticism and contortion ability. Very good hands as well. And then he's got a blocking blocking utility in his arsenal as well. So Roman Wilson, I like Ricky Pearsall. Kind of a similar appeal yeah. with Pearsall. I don't think he plays to his testing athleticism quite as much. So that's kind of my concern with him. But again, strong hands, alignment versatility, blocking utility. That's what you're getting. And then an interesting fit for me with the Bengals is Xavier Leggett from South Carolina. Uh, the more I watched him, the more I, I grew on his traits and his route running translatability. I think he's a guy who can play the X if you want him to, you know, alongside Jamar Chase, or you can play him at movement Z, move him around a little bit. Uh, 6'1", 220, really explosive athlete. Ran a 4'3", 40 yard dash. I think had elite explosive explosion numbers too, which isn't very surprising watching his tape. Uh, very good rack threat. Very good when he has a runway. But as a route runner too, I was really impressed with the fluidity the flexibility, uh, sustaining speed, again, while stressing angles and kind of using that to his advantage in space, stemming DBs and snapping back. He's shown that he can retract and, and use that stride freedom to his advantage. And then just a really instinctive catcher as well. The the catch radius is there. The body control is there. The hand strength is there. Um, so I think a lot of what you're looking for in that three-level threat framework for kind of a complementary weapon alongside Chase, if T does eventually move on, Xavier Leggett brings the size, the athleticism, and that versatility as well. So those are a few names that come to mind. Bottom line, though, this wide receiver class, if you're the Bengals, like this is the perfect year to need one because there is so much talent mm-hmm. on the board. And I think the Bengals have shown they're pretty good at drafting wide receivers too. I mean, they're, that that is a they're not good at drafting offensive tackles and they're not good at developing offensive tackles. Wide receivers, they're they're pretty good at identifying and developing the right guys. I think you could say the same thing. Ian, about cornerbacks, too. Cam Taylor Britt was a round two corner who's been successful. DJ Turner was a, was a hit as a rookie. I think cornerback is still an area where the Bengals could be looking for a little bit of depth. That could be something they pursue in free agency, either before or after the draft. Or They they love to go after their round two corners. I, there could be a guy like Nate Wiggins, maybe, or Kool-Aid McKinstry that maybe falls to them in the second round, but I think that seems unlikely. I think we're more looking at guys on your board like TJ Tampa from Clemson, Max Melton from Oregon. And it's Rekestral from Missouri. Is there one of these guys who stands out to you as a guy who maybe has the highest upside as a potential long-term number two cornerback for the Bengals? Yeah, well, real quick, I want to ask you guys, Lou Anarumo, is he more man zone oriented or is it more kind of a mix for him? It, he's he's willing to do whatever it takes from, Does from everything. game to game, half to half, whatever it takes. I love it. And hey, so I think you, he wants someone who's probably versatile and yeah. has that football IQ. I think they can handle all the stuff that he throws at him because every game is different. For sure. I love that. And we're kind of seeing that more and more. You know, like I I, yeah. I, I ask that a lot and I hear that a lot. Like, does this team, do they like man or zone? Like you need to be able to play either one based on situation. And I think, you know, it's never, mm-hmm. it's never, never black and white for a team, man or zone. Some teams like it more than others but it's always a mix right so i just want to ask that preemptively because some yeah. of these guys are more man oriented some are more zone but some do have versatility and i think those names that you mentioned we can start with that tj tampa for me is a really good option in round two if you're looking for that versatility because he's around six one he's got 32 inch arms i think so really good length really good physicality and press man so if you're in a rumo on those third downs if you want to get right in the wide receiver's face and disrupt that timing he can do that he's got the length he's got the physicality he's got really good twitch and foot speed as well but if you need him to play zone or off man tj tampa one of my favorite traits of his is his coverage variability he's got a really smooth pedal he can use kick slides off his back pedal to maintain hip leverage 
uh, really fluid athlete for his size, being a six foot one guy. Sometimes they have trouble sinking. Not the case with him. He's very good at that. And then he's a former wide receiver, so he's got ball skills too. So I think Tampa gives you the coverage variability, the ball skills, the physicality that you're looking for, and also run support. Max Melton is a really fun fit too because he's 5'11 with 32-inch arms. So he's very unique. You don't normally see that leverage and length combination with guys, but it gives him this profile where he can sink and redirect very easily, but then he still has the length to get inside your frame and disrupt the catch points. So really fun player. Very physical and press. He can play the slot or the boundary, so that versatility is there. I think he showcases really good route recognition in zone, too. There are a few times where either with physicality or with footwork, he can be a little uncontrolled. But I think back to, I don't know if you guys remember, Robert Alford played for the Falcons and the Cardinals a little bit. That's my comp for Max Melton. Really physical competitor. Can be a little volatile sometimes, but very explosive athlete with that proportional length and that, and that disruptive radius. Um, and just very good support ability, too. So Max Melton is a fun one. Rake Straw is more of a man-oriented corner. I'm a little concerned about him in zone and off man. He's more of a press man guy. He's very good when he's dictating the route depth off the release. But when he's out in space, he has enough vertical speed for sure. But there are times where his reaction to, say, comebacks or hitches is a little bit late. And he's not great sinking his hips on that. So Rake Straw, probably a guy you want him to keep the receiver in front of him and press man heavy schemes if you can. So out of those three I'd probably prefer Melton and um, Tampa. And then I'm going to go to my list here. There's so many day two corners, man. Uh, <laughs> it, it's tough. If, if McKinstry falls, I, that's probably – that's that's kind of a pipe dream. I expect him to go round yeah. one. But if he falls, I would like him a lot because he's versatile. He's got great support too. Very fluid as well. Um, looking at these guys, Chris Ab- Abrams Drain could be one. Very twitchy, a little lighter. Uh, I'd probably take him in round three. I'd wait for round three with him. But he's got speed, ball skills. Um, great support ability too. He plays beyond his frame in, in support. Very willing to come downhill. DJ James from uh, from Auburn is kind of in that similar mold, kind of lighter, leaner, but um, very physical, very explosive, really good impressed man, but very twitched up and fluid in zone and off man too. Um, and then there's a few others too. Bernardo Green from Florida State, not the most fluid guy, but very good impressed man. I think he's got some pedal technique. There's some reps where he took reps at safety as well. So he can pedal in space. Uh, he can manage spatial relationships with routes too. So the bottom line, man, a lot of fun players in this class. So one more that just popped into my head, Mike Sanderson from Michigan. Oh, yeah. yeah, that's your pure. I was just going to ask you about it. That's yeah. that's your per, that's probably your pure nickel guy. Although I do think he can play the boundary. He played pretty much everywhere at Michigan State or at Michigan, and there were reps where he did slide out the boundary for sure. But probably best in the slot. But he's another one who he can play safety as well. Really good pedal, really good route IQ. One of the most intelligent defenders in the class, I think, and that allows him to play confident and physical. And you see that on tape. Very good in support. He's a maniac as a blitzer, but his coverage ability is what won me over for him because he's explosive, he's fluid, he's a former wide receiver, and you can see that with his playmaking ability. But he's almost never in the wrong spot, and then he can play man in the slot. Uh, one of the most versatile, confident guys, and one of my favorite prospects. He's a top sixty-four guy for me. How many Michigan DBs can one team have? I mean, they've already got DJ exactly. Turner. They got Will they got Johnson Dax coming Bill. too, man. It's crazy. It's crazy. <laughs> uh, there's another position, and I don't think it's top of mind for the Bengals. I do think it's one they'll address in the draft. I, I, I want to ask about it because I think a lot of fans are interested in it, and that that's running back. Um, not just through the lens of of running back, but I, I think we, we have to look at the kickoff rule change, and, and you're going to need yeah. multiple – explosive returners back there. So I don't know, I don't know how much of, of your film study goes to the special teams element of it, but are, are there some day three running backs that, that you think could, can really be the next Isaiah Pacheco, so to speak, or the, these late round guys that bubble up to be starters and possibly give you that dynamic return ability? Yeah, it's a good question. I think it doesn't always stem to special teams for me. I try to, if a guy yeah. has special teams experience, I try to make note of that for sure. But, um, you know, it's tough. With some guys, you kind of have to project it, right? Like, do they have the yeah, traits mm-hmm. that they show as a runner that would translate well? And with the new, with the new kickoff rules, that's even more because the guys don't get a running start anymore. Uh, the, t- the teams, the special team, the defense has a little bit more of an opportunity to block and set up lanes for guys. So there's more of that opportunity. You don't need that, that game-breaking speed anymore. You can use vision, explosiveness, agility, quick cutting ability, right? So looking at that, a few guys that pop into my head, Dylan Lobby from New Hampshire, probably day three guy. I like him a lot, though. He's around 5'10", 208, so really compact, dense, well-leveraged guy who's very explosive, very agile. 
as a runner, I love how he stems guys, kind of like a receiver, but he'll he'll press upfield into blocks with his explosion, his bend, and then bait DBs into vacating lanes and then capitalizing on that. So I love that part of his game. And then one of the best receiving backs in the class too. I think he caught over 60 passes this past year, had one game against Central Michigan where he dominated, caught like 12 passes for 295 yards. So pretty insane numbers from him as a receiving back, but he's got really good running ability too. So I love that part of his game. A few guys, Kamani Vidal from Troy is one that pops into my head a little bit shorter five seven but over 200 really dense compact guy with that with that explosion that foot speed again and i I like how he can play through contact right so again you're working with the agility the burst to clear contact but then if you do encounter contact threats very low to the ground tough to bring down tough to halt with his momentum and his mass and then he's physical he's forward churning um i like that part of his game for sure i'm thinking about other guys let me pull up the list again because running back is one there's a lot of guys in that day two range Jalen Wright from Tennessee is one that comes to mind for me. He ran really fast, so it's going to be tough to see where he comes off the board. But if he's there in round four, um, he's got the explosion ability. Again, the, the pressing ability behind blocks, the agility and the twitch in his, in his lower body. And that speed can be a home run threat for him on kickoff returns too. So Jalen Wright is one that I like. Just a few more names. Marshawn Lloyd from USC. Uh, is very agile again very low to the ground compact i think around 5 8 2 15 again so he has the frame to withstand contact but he plays like a finesse rusher because he's so good at evading um, his ball security you want to improve because i think he had a very high fumble rate in college but again that mix of agility and physicality and contact bearing traits um he's got that combination for sure and then a few more isaac garendo from louisville that size speed profile yeah. Being six foot, 220, uh, that speed and bend. I love the curvilinear acceleration on tape. That's what pops into my head. And also his teammate, Jawar Jordan, by the way, probably will be undrafted, but I think he has return experience too. So a name to keep an eye on. A little bit smaller, not quite as athletic, but agile, very high energy runner who has that versatility. So Jawar Jordan could be an option, but Isaiah Garendo um, has that speed that size or Isaac Garendo has that spot that size speed uh, combination to uh, to work with there. So, and I can keep going, man, but there's so many running yeah. backs in the day three range, but those are a few that kind of pop in for me. And we're talking about special teams here. I, I think we have to talk about punter, right? I mean, the Bengals fans were not happy with Brad Robbins last year. I, the Bengals didn't bring anybody in free agency in. We don't know if they're going to be drafting anybody or if they're targeted, targeted an undrafted free agent. But is there a punter in this class worth drafting in? I don't even know if you scout punters. Do you scout special teams? I don't even know if you go that deep. But if you do, is there a guy in this class who, who the Bengals could look at? I don't go that deep. Uh, Ali will Ali will rag on me for this because Ali's a big special teams guy. But I, I I try not to. There's so much depth to to pay attention to in the skill positions that you don't always get a chance mm-hmm. to. And real quick, yeah. I just remembered a running back. I wanna I wanna plug one more running back. Yeah. Uh, Blake Watson from <laughs> Memphis, five nine one ninety. Yeah, yeah. Um, one of my guys throughout this cycle. Very fluid, very patient runner. So that's why I think he'll translate well on kickoff. He tested a lot better than I expected. I think he ran a four three eight, had a forty inch vertical at his pro day. So I didn't see that quite on tape, but I think that just compounds the excitement with him because he's very fluid, very agile, patient, disciplined runner who can use those lanes to his advantage. And he's a very good receiving threat too. So Blake Watson, Memphis, keep an eye on him. Um, But back to punter. Yeah, I don't, I, I don't, scout too much of that i i pay attention if they're if they're productive and you can tell with some guys like um tory taylor from iowa is one that comes to mm-hmm. mind for me i know there was one game i think in 2022 where early on because Iowa's offense you know everyone was talking about how how you know bad they were putting up points right yeah. and um they played south dakota state early in the year and they won like seven to nothing because they couldn't do anything and tory taylor had I think like 11 punts, nine of which went inside the 20 yard line, right? Some of which went inside the 10, maybe half of them went inside the 10 yard line. So if you're looking for pinpoint uh, pinpoint accuracy and the ability to pin teams deep, Tory Taylor is one that comes to mind for me. But um, that's, I, I can't give an in-depth breakdown, unfortunately. I spend so much time on the skill positions that the special teams yeah. get neglected sometimes. And I know Ali will probably listen to this. I'm sorry, Ali, in advance. <laughs> he's he's the big special teams guy. I'm, I'm kind of just sticking with skill positions. Yeah, it, it's amazing how many people have, have kind of jumped into this space, uh, the, the draft analyst, if you will. And, I mean, you're right up there with the best of them. That's the reason we wanted to have you on. But there are a lot. So I don't know how much you pay attention, what other guys are saying. It, 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 
a lot of times it kind of turns into this little bit of a group think where, you know, people, it, it, it just kind of an assessment on a guy kind of just catches fire and starts rolling and people start going with it. So I'm just curious if, if you look around the, that, that community of the people doing what you're doing, is there a, and maybe you already touched on this with some of the guys you like at the later round picks, but is, is there a, a guy out there that, that you think that the, the draft Nick community is, is most wrong about that, that he is going to be much better than maybe where a lot of people are slotting him. Hmm. It's a tough question, man. It really is. Cause there's a varying and you're absolutely right. Group think is, um, I think one of the most important things we're getting a little bit into the process side real quick here. Uh, but I think, yeah. you know, understanding bias and how it works is one of the most important things as an evaluator, because as a scout, you know, you do kind of have to be a primary adjacent source in a, in a sense, you know, like it's really just kind of what you're seeing and how you see things, the lens through which you see them can impact the outputs that you put on the page. Right. So you really have to be aware of biases and how group think works. And like, you know, every time I go through an evaluation, like I look at a guy, all right what impressions have been made on me already with this guy and what do i need to flush out before i watch the tape right so it's, it's mm -hmm. things like that you definitely need to be aware of it but i also think there's so many people in the space now that you have enough variance that usually you don't get guys who are too low across the board right so yeah. it's it's not something where you know that group thing can take over sometimes it's just more that variance plays in. I, I'm thinking of guys, Jermaine Burton from Alabama is one that I, I still think people haven't caught up on with his tape because his tape mm -hmm. purely on a tape grade got a top 50 grade for me. I think you know, the speed explosion, the route running ability, the, the bend, right? The hands, very strong, consistent hands. If he, he had a few off field issues. I, I remember he, he struck a fan after a game one time. So, you know, there are some character things that teams will want to do due diligence with, but Jermaine Burton from Alabama is one I'll say, if he's not, you know, if he's not an issue off the field, if he can get things ironed out, like he can be one of the best receivers from this class. And I think that's kind of where sometimes with with the draft, if you have a position that's so talent dense, like wide receiver, some sometimes guys do get flushed out a little bit and overlooked. And then you kind of have to sift through and see you have to get proper valuations on your own and see like, all right, who do we need to give more credence to? So that's one of the group think issues, I think. Uh, so he's, yeah. he's one that would be overlooked. And I think if there's a guy that's been overvalued, I don't know. I try not to rag on guys too much again, because everyone's board is different yeah. and every landing spot is different. Like we can project, but we don't know how they're going to pan out. But a couple guys that I'm maybe a little bit lower on uh, Tez Walker from UNC. I love the vertical threat ability that he provides, but the route tree is kind of limited right now. And he's not very flexible as a route runner. And then his hand technique can be inconsistent. So I have an early day three on him. And then Patrick Paul from Houston. I have an early day three on him too. I expect him to go off the board very high, like maybe top 50, because he is 6'7", 6'8", mm -hmm. 330, over 36-inch arms. So the size and power is very appealing with him. But technically, you know, looking at his hands, I think they're too wide a lot, and that can expose his frame to power. And he's not the most flexible athlete or mover as well. So he plays tall a lot. A lot of issues that could expose him to power and more nuanced rushers at the NFL level. So a couple guys that I'm lower on, but again, I think there's enough diversity of opinion where you can kind of sift through that and uh, kind yeah. of, uh, I'm trying to think of the word I'm blanking on the word, but you can navigate through it well enough. I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Um, last one for me. And, and again, thank you so much for the time today. You are just amazing at what you yeah, do. Exactly. I don't know how we would even cover the draft without your analysis. Like I don't even know how <laughs> no. we'd approach it. Um, a lot. This seems like there's some groups that position groups that are deeper than others this year. We talked about wide receiver. We talked about offensive tackle having that real depth and kind of high end talent. If the Bengals are going to look for certain positions on day three, are there groups that are deeper that you think they could find options? Is, is that defensive tackle? Is that cornerback? Is that maybe an edge defender? Are, are there some groups that have guys on day three that you think could become long term starters? And those are groups that the Bengals could be looking at on day three. I think interior offensive line could be one. Uh, and there's some guys that play at tackle that could translate to, to guard too. So you're looking at that. I think um, defensive tackle is one. There's a lot of depth in DT class, some three tech disruptors. 
that could translate well. I'm, I'm kind of racking my brain here, as you can see. Uh, I think the defensive back group, though, is the biggest one. I think safety, I think this safety class gets ragged on a little too much sometimes. I know the Bengals have, mm. they've made some moves. They got Geno Stone. Uh, they got Dax Hill, who's probably going to move to nickel, but they have Jordan Battle too. So they're they're set, reasonably set. But if you want a guy who has slot versatility, because Mike Hilton is going to be a free agent in 2025, you know, a guy like Tyke Smith, right? You know, we don't always hear his name and he's legit, man. But he might go on day three. Maybe he goes on day two, but even if he goes on day two, you've got guys like Thomas Harper, you know, who barely ever gets mentioned. I have a draftable grade on him too. So I think versatile safeties who can play nickel, I think there are so many of those guys in this class. A lot of versatility, a lot of role flexibility, a lot of playmaking ability, physicality and support, things that you really love to see at the safety position. I think corner as well, some guys who have that slot corner versatility, Daquan Hardy from Penn State, Miles Harden from South Dakota, probably be a round six, round seven guy at best. But I do think these guys have the physical traits and the intangibles to potentially be really good players on the line. So um, broad scale, if I could cliff notes what I just said, because <laughs> I, I ramble a lot, but um, there are a few positions on the offensive side the trenches for sure but i think the db group is probably the deepest one that marries up with what the bengals like to do they, they like to take stabs i mean they did it last year with dj ivy in the seventh round they, yeah. that is a one of their go-to moves take one of those take a corner with, with one of their last picks absolutely jay anything else any other any questions for ian i feel like we've bombarded him with absolutely every bengals no. possible topic and i just it's incredible to watch you to watch you even rack your brain Ian, like come up with these names and come up with these scouting reports. It, it truly is amazing to watch. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us on today's show. I am like beyond excited for this draft. I think using the MDS simulator every night before I go to bed and doing 10 drafts might not be good for my mental health <laughs> and my sleep. But like it, between reading you and, and doing that, that's how I'm learning the prospects. And I think there are just so many options and paths i think the bengals could explore that that it makes it interesting with what three weeks left to go yeah the draft process is man the, the the most fun about it is that it's all about exploring outcomes and kind of thinking about what might happen we don't know what's going to happen but the best we can do is explore the outcomes so that you're not too surprised by anything and if you do see a name that you don't know we have the information for you so that's the biggest thing you know just kind of hedging for all those outcomes and covering all our bases and that's the fun part it's a little grueling sometimes but that's what we signed up for and this is the best time of year for that and I was, I mean, Dallas mentioned it, we lean on you so much for, for this, yeah. this time of year, but, um, you know, for some people that are just kind of Bengals focused and, and may not be aware yet, uh, give some, what are the other podcasts you're on? Where can people find you on Twitter? Well, where can, where can they find all your work? Yes. You can follow me at IC underscore draft on Twitter. Um, I'll try and post my articles there. I got a pinned pin thread at the bottom of my profile at the top of my profile. Um, and any questions you have, feel free to hit me up there. I try to be responsive when I can. Um, I'm on the PFN Scouting Podcast as well. Uh, Derek Tate is my co-host there right now, and I very, very much enjoy talking football with him. Like I said at the start, we just finished up our QB podcast today. It's talking about Drake May, Caleb Williams, Jaden Daniels, JJ McCarthy. A lot of discourse on those guys, so feel free to check that out. And then um, we got the MDS. A lot of great stuff in there. Allows you to kind of take a front seat as the GM and kind of play through those outcomes. We're getting more reports in there every day from my reports on the site. Um, so that's becoming more comprehensive and immersive for you. And then you'll probably see me popping on other podcasts, team specific pro podcasts across the landscape. I try to, I have a hard time saying no to people. So I, I, yeah. I, my schedule is pretty packed this time of year, but um, again, it's what we signed up for. So I see underscore draft. That's where you can find me. I appreciate you guys for having me on. This was a lot of fun. Uh, of no, course, thank you. We, we, yeah. Yeah, thank we, you we'd love it. to have you on after the draft too. To once we see yeah. who the Bengals actually get, and we can talk about these prospects again. Uh, one last thing, I think I did see on Twitter that you're you're finalizing your big board April fifteenth. Is that right? Yes. Is that that's when you'll have your, okay. Yep. So we got tax day. We got the big board. It's it's a big day it's a big on April fifteenth. We've got everything going on. Thank you again to Ian yes. for joining us today. Um, we will be back next week with more Bengals talk, and like I said, we'll have Ian on after the draft to go over all these prospects again. Um, until then, we will talk to you next week. We'll